Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Amy Landon. I'm the Director of Communications here at Bernheim. We're really thrilled to have the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group here today to talk a little bit about Golden Eagle research, not just at Bernheim, but beyond. So I'm going to toss it over to Andrew Berry and let you all enjoy uh, the conversation. Thanks again. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, really excited to have a couple of special guests today. We've got Todd Katzner um, with the USGS. He's uh, kind of the, the lead on the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group that we're hosting here at Bernheim this week. Uh, and also we've got Tom Wittick, who is a Northeast coordinator for Eagles uh, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, so this morning, we just wanted to have a conversation and really kick off the uh, the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group. Uh, we've got a whole a whole bunch of biologists and other decision makers from around the country that are going to be convening upon Bernheim to talk about golden eagles and also to talk about a Eastern Golden Eagle conservation plan, which is a long time coming. We're really excited about that. Um, so I'm going to go through a, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to talk about uh, the meeting, we're going to talk about some of the threats to golden eagles and why we need a conservation plan. And we're also going to be updating you all on Athena, of course, our beloved golden eagle from here at Fernheim, and talk a little bit about her. She's she's now on her migration heading up towards Canada. Uh, so we're really excited to share that information with you all. So let me uh, let me share a screen here. And um, of course, at the end, if you all have any questions about eagles uh, or anything Bernheim related, we're glad to to discuss that as well. So here we go. All right. Uh, Amy, is that showing up for you? Good. Okay. So as I mentioned before, we've got Todd Kastner. Todd is uh, um, recently relocated from Boise, Idaho. Um, and now he has moved back east and he is fully engaged and trying to do what he can to protect Golden Eagles. As I mentioned, Tom Wittig uh, is down from the Northeast U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He is the Northeast Coordinator for Eagles. Um, and again, I'm Andrew Berry, the Director of Conservation here at Bernheim. Um, before we get started, I do want to thank some of our supporters. Uh, that includes Beckham Bird Club. They've been incredibly supportive of Bernheim for decades uh, for all things birds. Um, uh, but in particular, also supporting our Golden Eagle efforts here with the tracking and our other research. Also want to thank the Kentucky Audubon Council, who's also been a generous supporter of Bernheim uh, throughout the years for all things birds. Um, and in addition to that, I also wanted to thank uh, the family and friends of Judge Boyce Martin Jr. Um, they pulled together and they have been supporting Bernheim uh, for a few years now for projects, including the, the MODIS bird tracking, but also the Golden Eagle work. Um, and, um, you know, Judge Martin was a longtime um, president of Bernheim. He was on the board of trustees. He's a figure within the greater Louisville area. Um, and we do some of this work to support his, uh, his legacy and also um, as a way for his friends and family to remember him and support Bernheim. So I wanted to start and talk a little bit about why we're here and why I've got these two gentlemen next to me. Um, we are going to be working over the next few days to kind of un unveil a new draft of an Eastern Golden Eagle conservation plan. Um, and Todd, in particular, has been working on this stuff for decades now. Um, I've got a map up here, as you can see on the screen, of Golden Eagle telemetry that dates back to 2006. Um, and this map was pulled together through work of, of just a whole lot of biologists. And you'll see. Uh, the paper that this was kind of related to is the status biology and conservation priorities for North, North America's Eastern Golden Eagle population. Uh, this was a paper that Todd spearheaded back in 2012, and it kind of got us to this point today. Todd, do you want to talk a little bit about, about how this paper was developed? Sure. Um, and actually, could we minimize the, the yeah. thing on the right? Yeah. I think that is showing up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there we go. That's, that's blocking some of the map. So, you know, in, in 2005, when I moved to Pittsburgh, um, 
I I kind of thought what most people thought about golden eagles in the east. That they occasionally showed up at, at hawk migration sites, but <clears throat> they were probably vagrants from the west or some, some weird birds that were out there. And it wasn't really a good understanding of what was going on. And but as I learned more and more, as I looked at some of the, the little bits of literature that existed, we realized there is this population of golden eagles in the east that was poorly studied, not well understood. And uh, as you can tell, this so this map on the right shows GPS tracks of golden eagles that uh, our team has has tagged over the years. And you know, there's I think there's 369 birds shown on this map. That includes a lot of birds from Wyoming, and California, but a huge number of birds from the east, uh, including several from Bernheim and the surrounding states and areas. Um, but uh, these birds all spend their summer in Canada. They breed in Quebec, Ontario, uh, Labrador, and. Uh, and then they, they come back down south and they spend the winter in places like Bernheim, uh, places, remote places in the Appalachians where they get away from people, where there's good topography that provides updraft, and where there's good populations of, of, uh, of deer that die as roadkill or winter kill or turkeys or, or other food species for these birds. <clears throat> so in 2010, we had our first meeting of the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group. We pulled this group together because we realized there was a strict this population that was poorly known, and we wanted to develop plans to promote conservation of the species, but also to raise awareness. And so the, the this paper that Andrew is referring to that's highlighted on the left side of the screen, that was really the first product that we had created, the first paper to show, to describe this, this population, to describe some of the threats it faces, and potentially what we might want to do to protect this species. Um, so I think that that kind of gets it most of what you were asking yeah. about, Andrew. Yeah, and so, you know, golden eagles in the east were really relatively unknown until some of the work that you all have been doing over the past few decades kind of shed some light on that. Um, Tom Winnick, um, the Northeast Coordinator for Eagles for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is with us. He um, is also fully engaged and, and he works to protect these eagles through a number of different means. Um, and part of what we wanted to do by convening this group and working on this conservation plan for Golden Eagles um, is to address some of these threats. Um, so there are a lot of threats. Tom, can you talk a little bit about some of these threats and how U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, is addressing those? Sure, absolutely. So uh, golden eagles <clears throat> are not threatened or endangered at the federal level, um, but they do have their own law protecting them. That's the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Uh, originally, it was passed just as the Bald Eagle Protection Act, but golden eagles were added in sometime during the 60s. Um, just in recognition that they deserve protection as well, and their populations needed the support. Uh, that law protects the obvious things. You can't intentionally kill eagles, um, but it also addresses some of the unintentional or incidental impacts of eagles as well. Um, so we have systems set up to authorize those types of impacts when they're strictly necessary, but we only ever give those authorizations. It's also offset. And so either directly through our permitting or indirectly through the mitigation of those involved, we try to tackle a lot of the issues you see on this list. Um, now, obviously some of them are more direct, uh, easier to intervene with, but overall the services are trying to try address and help uh, resolve each of these issues. Sure, so, um, you know, in our area, I've got loss of habitat listed as a number one threat. Um, we do see that a lot around Bernheim. It's probably not as much of an issue on the summer grounds for the golden eagles when they're up in Canada. But specifically, we wanted this Eastern Golden Eagle Conservation Plan to kind of focus on those threats in the lower 48. Is that is that correct, Todd? The, the conservation plan, we're actually trying to get uh, trying to get concepts together to address threats to these eagles actually across the, the breeding cycle, across the distribution. So it is. It includes a fair bit of information from Canada. Uh, the 
to the extent that there is more information from the US, uh, that is largely because there's further spending time in the lower 48 where there's a lot more people and we have, we have better access to these sites. It's really difficult to get to some of the breeding areas up in Canada. There's less fuel roads, less infrastructure. And so uh, we just don't understand those threats mm -hmm. quite as well up there. Uh, but I will say the government of Quebec has done a great job of putting together plans and strategies to manage that population. And I, I would actually, I think that, you know, some of that is a direct result from the focus that we have put on this species through the Eastern Bulgaria Working Group creation of things like this conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tom, so the, the other threats we have listed, mm -hmm. lead poisoning, obviously that's usually from scavenging um, of, of deer or other hunted animals, um, incidental trapping, which relates to people who are, are doing, you know, usually foothold traps for other, other animals, not intentionally getting golden eagles. And then wind turbines, obviously that's part of our new renewable energy strategy here in the United States. Um, do we know how much of an impact this is having on golden eagle population and whether it has decreased golden eagles in the east or whether we think that golden eagles may be rebounding a little bit because of some of this interest? Sure, yeah, it's a good question. So nationally, we know that golden eagles in the U.S. Um, are stable at best, and their populations may actually be headed towards a longer term decline, which is unfortunate. Uh, in the East, a lot of our population estimates are based on modeling done on community science data based around Hawkwatch data, and also some of the information we've gathered through these telemetry studies that Todd and his partners um, have collected. Um, so in the East, it does seem like they're stable, but again, there's some inference around that. Um, so. Our goal is to help uh, stabilize and potentially even increase these populations. And that is actually a very specific goal and mandate of the Ball and Gold Neal Protection Act. Um, you know, I, I look at the list and number two, I think it's a great example of the power of this conservation plan. Um, so a lot of facets, the lead poisoning, um, we do know it's an issue um, throughout both bald and golden eagles in the US. And again, that's that's due to the awesome research that Todd and his collaborators have pulled together. So the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group, we have these researchers. We also have managers, myself, but also our state partners, and our provincial partners up in Canada. So we have the information. We also have some of these policy and regulatory tools. And the conservation plan will be important to coordinating all of that to make it as effective as possible. Right. And then and then also uh, the fifth uh, threat is climate change. And of course, that's one of those larger issues. that's harder to actually pin down. Um, we know that, you know, wind turbines is one of those solutions. Renewable energy can help uh, mitigate some of the fossil fuel dependence that may be fueling climate change. And so there's a lot of complexity in there, too, around these threats. Um, so it's a, it's a big challenge, but it's really um, it's really inspiring to me to have a group like like Todd and Tom and the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group come down to Bernheim to kind of tackle some of these issues. Um, and of course, you know, down here at Bernheim, you all have heard a lot over the, the past decade about some of the eagles that we track. And Todd here is actually one of the, the figures that, that helped us to get into the Golden Eagle research. Uh, working with him, we've been deploying camera traps at Bernheim since 2008. Uh, so that's 15 years now that we've been gathering data Todd, how did that camera trapping uh, program get going and, and how successful has that been? You know, the, the camera trapping program has been really successful. It got going because, uh, really because we wanted to start trapping birds. And uh, we realized we, we, we were trying to trap eagles when they were migrating. And it's really hard to get an eagle that's migrating to change its mind and decide to stop migrating and come into your trap site. Uh, but what we realized is if we put a, uh, if we go to a site where the eagles are feeding in the winter, they come in on a daily basis. We do a lot of scavenging on, on winter kill deer and, and road kill deer and things like that. 
And so we decided uh, as part of this that we were going to try and trap birds during winter. And uh, I'll tell you, after a few days of frankly freezing our butts off, waiting for eagles to come in and not having success, we said, well, what if we put a trail camera on this, on this bait pile that we've got? And then we can check that trail camera every day. We can come pull the memory card and see if there's eagles coming in. And we don't have to freeze our butts off for a week until an eagle comes in. We just wait until the camera tells us there's an eagle there. And then we can go out the next day and we think the eagle's really likely to come back in. So that's how we got started with it. But the camera trapping program took on a life of its own because we ended up at one point with, we've got about 350 sites where people have deployed uh, trail cameras on, usually on deer carcasses. And we've been, we've been able to aggregate the camera data from all of that. We have a really good idea of the distribution of, of, uh, of golden eagles in the East because of that, those trail camera data. Um, and so we've had a couple of papers that we published using these trail camera data, understanding what species come into these bait piles, how what's the distribution of golden eagles, and how those golden eagles might be affected by climate change. So all of this stuff is stuff that has spun directly from that camera trapping, and the camera trapping was really started out as an attempt to try to get a better to try to keep us warmer, frankly, when we were trapping, mm -hmm. uh, but it turned into something that had a life of its own. It was really, really yeah. valuable. Yeah, ca camera trapping has been such a revolutionary tool for biologists. It's so non-intrusive. And really, I mean, 15 years ago, the cameras were, were pretty crude. And now we're at a point here in, in 2023 where the cameras are just, you know, you get remarkable images. And this stuff is has really, I mean, revolutionized biology. And, and has shown people all kinds of incredible animals that are around their property. Um, so later today, uh, Dr. Tricia Miller and Mike Lanzone from Cellular Tracking Technologies are gonna be joining us here for the meeting. Uh, they're coming down from New Jersey. They of course are, are um, instrumental in our camera or in our uh, eagle trapping, different from the camera trapping, but the actual trapping of an eagle and deploying the trackers. They uh, They've designed and built these uh, solar uh, golden eagle trackers and, and make trackers for other birds and, and other species. So um, they're going to be down here. And, you know, we spent some time in a blind with them this year and um, just an incredible week. It was it was cold. It was late January. We sat in there for about 50 hours. Me and my colleague Evan Patrick from our natural areas manager here at Bernheim. And we observed Athena and her new mate. Um, so if you all have been following the story, you might know that Harper, her original mate, uh, was lost in the wilds of Canada back in uh, 2021. Um, since then, she spent a year kind of on her own from what we could tell. But as of last year and last summer, we've noticed that she has been hanging out with another bird. Um, and to the, you know, even to the point that we found that her tracks from last year up in Canada showed that she spent a lot of time on the nest, which suggested that she may have successfully fledged a chick. And when she arrived back here in Bernheim uh, last November, we were able to see that she was hanging out with another bird. Uh, so we, we set in motion a plan to try to trap and put a transmitter on this other golden eagle. And we weren't successful. We spent 50 hours, four days. And for about 90% of that time, we actually could see the golden eagle <laughs> sitting in a tree about a quarter of a mile away. I think they may have been on to us, right? Um, and they were, this is how they look from afar. One of them staring at you and the other one looking the other direction. And um, I wanted to play some audio that we got and, and see what you guys thought about it. This is a call that we recorded while they were sitting in the tree and had some bald eagles. <laughs> This is actually the two eagles going back and forth. I, I think the male might be the more high pitched. You know, I'm terrible with my ears, and other, but yeah, I think that people who are great can probably tell the two apart. And, but it, it is really neat to look at this. Yeah, something really interesting. 
，比方说你是那个做那个什么的，然后我再把手机拿来，然后就是用手机来做，就是做这个。你让你让他们就是在就是新闻里面，就是 actually， 我们一定是做完就是新闻，然后我们就是对，就是这个东西。Yeah. Um, so, what do we know about interaction between golden eagles and bald eagles? So, this was as a bald eagle kind of approached um, the bait site, and they, they didn't like that. Do we know much about how they interact or pollinate each other? Um, well, both type of eagles enjoy free meal. So, you'll see both of them in these big piles. Um, I'd actually prefer to talk about free meal, you know, who wins out in the bait pile. You know, there's, there's... It really seems like the context is dominant, and what we think we don't know. But well, two things: first of all, the eagle that is hungry is the more likely one to be in the more aggressive and shape of another. Size probably matters. Female eagle is probably going to chase off a male eagle. Female eagles are bigger than bigger than male eagles. Age may matter. There was a paper published about a year or two ago suggesting that uh, young birds actually depend on carrion a little bit more, and that the plumage differences that young birds have might actually be an indicator to an old bird that this is a young bird that's more likely to be hungry, so I should just get out of its way. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of interactions among species, one of the things we see is that when there's only one or two, when there's only two or three eagles present, golden eagles tend to dominate. They're the bosses, but bald eagles often forage in big groups. And so we've got pictures of 10 or 15 bald eagles on a deer carcass. And when you've got 10 or 15 bald eagles, golden eagles don't even bother to show up. They're, they're much more solitary or, or an eagle species that, that operates in small groups, and when there's big groups, they just get out of town. They're they're kind of an introvert, kind of like me. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, that makes sense. So when it comes to a bait pile, size matters, whether it's an individual bird or whether it's the size of the group they run with. Yep. Um, that's pretty cool. What would you call a group of eagles? Is there is there a term for that? It's not I, that. You know, I wish my wife was here. She knows <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know what you call a group of eagles. So I wanted to show a few pictures here so that, and, and you'll have to forgive the, the large uh, deceased deer in the middle of these images. You know, I, I always cringe a little bit when I show these pictures and it's got the deer, but I mean, that's just a basic part of, of how you draw in these large predators and scavengers. You got to have some bait and, and we use roadkill deer here at Bernheim. So it's stuff that is just laying on the side of the highway, which is a, you know, a, an eyesore or even a, a hazard for, for motorists. Uh, and we also make sure that all none of these deer have been shot. You know, you definitely want to make sure you're not using anything that was deposited from a hunter uh, that might have lead in it. And then we stake these down and we stake them down because the coyotes will dra drag them off. So we get a whole lot of interactions with bald, with bald eagles, coyotes, bobcats. Uh, but we wanted to show these pictures here just from uh, this is January 20th of this year. And this is Athena here. You can see that little ruffle up on her back. That's uh, where the transmitter is. Transmitter kind of sits down in there. Um, so we were really pleased to see. She's, she's just a beautiful bird. She's so healthy looking and, and really a, a presence down there on her territory. Um, this is another picture of her from the side. And then in the next image I'm gonna show, it's a different bird. And it's really hard to tell these golden eagles apart, isn't it, Todd? It, it is really, really hard. If you do really careful work and you get a lot of pictures, mm -hmm. you can look at patterns on the on the, the wing, the upper wing. We call those coverts, those small feathers that are up near the top. You can identify patterns in that, but you know you've got to look at a lot of pictures and really focus on it. To yeah. Start to see those kinds. Yeah, and that's what we were using too, these coverts, but also the timing of how one would be on the bait and then it would leave and then another would come down. And the fact that they seemed to be tolerating it, each other around the bait site gave us some clues that they were tolerant of each other and could be a mate. And so this is the, uh, this is the other one, that, uh, the one that we think is Athena's mate. And um, it, it seemed to be a little smaller than Athena. Um, is that generally the case, uh, Tom? Is that 
usually what happens with eagles or the birds of prey they call yeah. it sexual dimorphism mm -hmm. and so often the males are smaller than the females just typically within the species mm -hmm. is that possibly because of the nesting um there's there's a lot of speculation about why it might be um Todd, do you have any thoughts there? There's a lot of speculation yes. and few conclusive ideas. Right. I, I think every few years somebody publishes a new paper and has a really good idea, and there is nothing that has stuck as the answer in the scientific right. community. It's one of those things that is debated, and you know, probably in 20 or 30 years we'll have figured it out. Mm -hmm. For now, I'm just not sure. Yeah, yeah. It it definitely seems in our case here, and maybe I'm drawing some strong inferences, but it, it seems that Athena may kind of rule the roost in this in this relationship, being that she's the larger bird, and also she's maintained this territory and switched mates. Mm -hmm. And and also still using her nest up in Canada while switching mates. That suggests that she's got a, a little bit of pull. Um and I thought that was interesting. This was a, an image we got from January 22nd. And this was the only image we had of Athena and the other bird together. And I thought that was really good evidence. Um, you can see Athena on top of the deer with the uh, transmitter visible, actually. The little, you can see that little box on her back in the upper center corner. Um, and then the other bird um, is down there and he's got his foot on the deer too. And, um, you know, that's, that's that's just a really, you know, an interesting image for me, and and I thought it said a lot about how they would tolerate each other to be there. Yeah, yeah. No aggression between the two. It yeah. looks like right. It, it's hard to know exactly what's going on, you know. And golden eagles um, do, you know, we, we do occasionally see more than one bird on a bait pile, but we very rarely know any history of these birds. Mm -hmm. And this case where we know history on at least one of them. We know that she has tolerated a bird that was a mate, you know, on during winter as well. And so that might be a clue that there's something similar going on here. Yeah, I have to say it's just amazing to get these intimate views of these birds. Yeah. I mean, yeah. especially for folks that manage them for a living, they often assert points to reduce the data points. You know, you yeah. see the maps, you see the tracks, population numbers, but to get this view and for the convenience of not having to freeze my butt off, it is just right. amazing. So yeah. Yeah. credit to you all for yeah. that. Thank you. Um, and then, so, and we were also getting some images of another eagle they were tolerating. Yeah. Um, we were really pleased to see this juvenile uh, yeah. golden eagle. Tom, how could we tell this would be a juvenile? What, what kind of indicators would you use? Sure, so you look at the plumage, that is the feathers and what exactly they're wearing. Um, birds will molt their feathers each year just to help them um, replace feathers, keep in good body condition. Um, and for a lot of large body raptor species, they don't get that distinctive plumage until several years out, until basically they're ready to breed. Um, you know, this is pretty obvious with bald eels. You have that distinctive white head and white tail. It's a little more subtle with gold. So here, uh, one of the keys you can see is that white on the tail right there. Mm -hmm. um, that helps you indicate this is a younger bird, not yet mature. Yeah. Another another clue with this bird, uh, if you look at the feathers, so if you look at the feathers of the older birds that we were seeing, um, Andrew and I were talking about the coverts and how there was a pattern of light and dark in those coverts on the upper wing. And if you look at this bird, all the feathers are exactly the same color. And what happens with golden eagles is that as their feathers get older, they kind of fade, right? And so when you've got a bird where all the feathers are exactly the same color, you know that they have all those feathers have exactly the same amount of wear. They've faded exactly the same amount. And that only happens with the first year bird. So this is a bird that's in its first winter. And as Tom said, you can see there's white on the tail as well. Mm -hmm. Those are the two clues that you would really look for. So it's really, it's really encouraging for me to hear you say that this bird would be in his first winter. So that would mean that he was born uh, in, the, in the, or he or she would have been born in the summer or hatched, yeah. should I say, in, in, yeah, to get that correct, in the, uh, in the summer of 2022. And that is the year we know that from the from Athena's tracks that she was on the nest quite a bit. And she seems from her from her, you know, looking at her behavior um, that summer that she would have been she would have laid an egg in April 
and she would have hatched it around um, late May, early June, and then she spent a lot of time with it on the nest before looking like she might have been fledging a chick. So it it would fit with the time um, that that we were looking at the time frame. And the other thing that we thought was interesting, Evan Patrick, my colleague uh, here at Bernheim and me, had been seeing this bird uh, in the same vicinity as Athena and the other. And to actually, we saw it when we were in the blind. We saw that juvenile. Uh, flying. Uh, but, you know, for this image here on January 22nd, we actually know that Athena was in that same hollow, a few hundred yards away from where this juvenile had landed at the bait. I thought that was really interesting, isn't it, Todd? It, it is really cool. Um, we, you know, this could be a, this could be their, her offspring. It could be a completely different juvenile bird. Mm -hmm. uh, we really don't know. If we were able to get feathers from both, we could do genetic testing and probably figure it out. Uh, but, you know, adult eagles, sometimes we think that one of the reasons that they might have these plumage differences between adult and young birds is that the adult birds know that a young bird like that is not going to be a threat on breeding grounds. It's not gonna try and take its territory because it's gonna take this young bird four or five years until it reaches breeding age, until it's capable of holding that territory. Um, those same signals might work on wintering grounds. And so it may be that an adult sees a juvenile and says, you know what, I'm cool, you hang out, we'll both be here. I can tolerate a juvenile or two. Mm -hmm. um, but at yeah. the same time, if it's its own offspring, it might even be more tolerant. And we just don't know, but it's kind of cool to think about. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that's really neat about this picture that I, that I liked about this picture, I can tell you that this bird has been feeding a lot today already. And if you look on its, on its neck, or its upper chest, there's a white spot. And that is right where the crop is on these birds. And the crop is a food storage organ. So an eagle, if it, if it goes out and feeds and it fills its belly, it's gonna get hungry in a few hours. So they've got this extra few food storage organ a little bit higher up in the digestive tract and that's their crop and they can fill that with food. And then they've got two or three times as much food as they can fit in their belly and they can get a lot. They don't have to feed every, every few hours because of that. Um, but those white, those white feathers are indicative that this bird has a full crop. So the, the crop is kind of pushing out the feathers on its breast. And that's why it looks white. Um, so this, this is a bird that's been eating a lot. We would say he's really cropped out and it's kind of fun to see that on it. On it. Very cool. I love that inside. Um, this is just another picture of a juvenile down there. It may be the same bird. Or it's a little bit hard to tell in this, in this, uh, image, but I did want to, to update us on what Athena has been doing over the winter. So, um, and then also talk a little bit about her migration. So uh, if you all have been following the story, you know that Athena comes back to Bernheim every November uh, from up there in Canada. And so this year she, she arrived in, uh, in November on the 16th and she flew straight into Bernheim. Um, she crossed over uh, near West Point and then crossed the uh, Fort Knox area, which is a pretty substantial block of forest, um, and, then, and then came right into Bernheim. Um, and let me show the next slide, shows a little closer view of what she did. This is her tracks for the whole winter. Um, so you can see up there in the upper center uh, map, Bernheim is outlined in yellow. And you can see they spend a, a lot of time right in the, in the heart of Bernheim, but also it overlaps um, their core territory with Knob State Forest and some of the other large uh, landowners in Fort Bernheim. Uh, but, but later in the winter, um, as, the, as the deer got more scarce and there was less bait out, um, they really started roaming around a lot more. So you can see Athena traveling throughout the knobs here in central Kentucky. Uh, visiting other large forested areas, heading all the way down south of New Haven, um, down toward Towardstown, making some trips over into Fort Knox again, even approaching um, Elizabethtown a couple of times and, and over in that Keith Knob area. Um, so Todd, how, how do these golden eagles really, I mean, what are they looking for on these winter habitats? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. We we see this pattern uh, an awful lot with golden eagles, where 
you know, if you if you read the, the classic literature on golden eagles and you look at data from the American West, uh, the literature says that golden eagles are an open country bird. And the, the data show this too. You see golden eagles in grasslands and sagebrush of Wyoming and Idaho and Utah and Nevada. And you don't see them in the trees. And when you get to the east, um, you don't, there, there isn't as much open country and you don't see them in the trees, but you also don't see them in the open country. And then when you tag them, you realize that they spend almost all their time in the trees. And the reason that you don't see them is because a brown bird against a brown tree is really hard to see. Uh, but it turns out when we look at the telemetry data, we see this pattern a lot where these birds cross the open country and they spend a lot of time perched or foraging in these clumps of trees. And that is really one of the unique aspects of the biology of Eastern golden eagles that makes them stand out from golden eagles in the West. And I know it, it I mean, it surprised the heck out of us. We started this work. I would tell people that I thought golden eagles probably spent time in the, you know, in, in, in clear cuts, strip mines, things like that. And it turns out they avoid all that stuff. And they just go to the deep forest and they hang out there. And we're not really sure exactly why, but we know that they do this. They end up in areas with steep topography. We think we know why that they like the topography. And that's because when there's topography, there's updraft. Golden eagles don't like to flap their wings. They're a big bird, it takes a lot of effort to flap their wings. And so if you can soar on that updraft, then you're gonna be you're gonna be expending a lot less energy, you have to eat less food, and you're gonna survive for a longer period of time. And so what you see with this bird and with many other birds is that the steep forest is often in the most rugged terrain. And the golden eagles are in the forest, and they're in the rugged terrain. And we know at least why they're in the rugged terrain. We don't always know why they're in the forest, but it's a pretty cool behavior. It's a really surprising one. And it's one that really opened their eyes to some of the unique aspects of their biology. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see that they, you know, there's a lot of people that live within this, this area that she is, has utilized last winter. I'd say a handful saw a golden eagle, if not only one or two people. Yeah. And people that did see it probably thought it was a it was a vulture or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so just just incredible. Just gives you reason to keep your eyes to the sky and always be uh, optimistic about what you might see out there. Um, and then when she left on migration, um, you know, we had a huge wind event on March the third. Hurricane force winds that hit. Bernheim um, and all throughout Central Kentucky. And so she left actually the day after that. So the morning after that windstorm on March the 4th, she took off and um, she had spent the night actually outside of Bernheim over in some knobs that are that are pretty close, just still within our, I would say our knobs complex here. And, uh, but she took off and she went in a direction that was a little different. Um, than what we normally see. She actually took off in a southwestern direction and headed all the way down south of Elizabethtown. Uh, for folks that know, Elizabethtown is a, is a growing and bustling community uh, near Bernheim, and then went right by Glendale. Uh, Glendale, of course, is a, a location where um, they're now building the new Toyota, or I'm sorry, the new Ford battery plant. Uh, which is she obviously saw it's a it's a really large several square mile development going on down there and then she crossed straight over Stevensburg which is a place that's really dear to my family's uh, roots and flew directly over Stevensburg Lake uh, on her way up towards the Ohio River um, and then in this next map we'll show a, what we know now uh, so as of yesterday she did check in yesterday she doesn't check in every day only when she's near a cell tower and um, so she crossed over the Ohio River a little bit west of Brandenburg, uh, went right up through the Hoosier National Forest, um, Brown County uh, State State Park, uh, which is one of her preferred migratory routes. She flies over there all the time, um, right off of the, the western edge of Indianapolis's metropolitan area, and then headed up towards Michigan. 
So, Tom, I wanted to ask you, as they're flying up through the Midwest, obviously the Midwest, once you get past the Hoosier National Forest, you get into a lot of that agricultural land. Um, it's a lot more flat. There's also a lot of uh, changes up there with a lot more um, wind farms that have gone in. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the some of the threats and how she might navigate some of that? Sure. Yeah, there's there's a lot to challenge for it on the landscape nowadays, but they still manage. Um, yes, wind turbines can unfortunately be a source of mortality for certain birds. Um, keeping in mind also that in the longer term, they're also facing threats from climate change, which are insidious and also may affect their survival over time. Um, but we know in some senses they actually can take advantage of uh, certain aspects of human development. So I've been fortunate enough to actually do some surveys with our agency out west, um, flying planes looking for golden eagles. And uh, one of the spots I love to perch is pivot irrigation. So it gives them opportunity to look around. But these are eastern birds, and so they face different landscape, different challenges. Um, you know, another unfortunate challenge they face is actually uh, collisions with vehicles. And so I was thinking this earlier where you're talking about mm -hmm. the uh, roadkill deer you place out as your base sites. There's some added benefit to actually pulling those off the shoulders of the road because unfortunately, as I mentioned, eagles love a free meal. So they'll show up at uh, those roadkill sites and they may get flushed off by one car passing, fortunately fly to the next. Mm -hmm. So you know, as they do these amazing migration journeys traveling hundreds of miles, they need to you know, physically navigate the landscape. They need to find places to roost. They also need to find sources of food that aren't going to threaten their survival. And it is amazing too to see this bird make the hop over the water because uh, that is a challenge for golden eagles and not every bird can do that. Yeah, yeah, we've really seen that they they don't like flying out over the Great Lakes. So Athena actually only once she she had a. One year she came in uh, over Lake Superior and actually flew down to one of the islands. Um, and it may have been a, a mistake. I, I don't she may have done it intentionally. I'm not sure. But but they have really specific crossings, don't they, Todd, when they migrate? We, we're we actually working on a project with some of Tom's colleagues, different Fish Wildlife Service office, to study how bald and golden eagles cross the Great Lakes. And the, the reason for that study is, is that there's a lot of offshore wind going on, so being installed in the Great Lakes. And the service has indicated to us an interest to try to understand what, if you, what might be the dangerous places to put a wind turbine over the Great Lakes. So we have probably the only data set on eagles migrating over the Great Lakes. We can take our GPS telemetry data, much like this, and we can we can provide some guidance on what are those hot spots for for eagle crossings, and then presumably uh, people other than USGS scientists can use that information to to inform decision making uh, about where where to put turbines and, and what spots might be good to avoid. Very cool. Very from, cool. Good from the perspective. Yeah, and so she crossed over the Straits of Mackinac, which is one of those narrow points, um, which allows them to cross over into the Upper Peninsula. And as of yesterday, like I mentioned, she was at Sault Ste. Marie waiting to make a, a border crossing over into Canada. And uh, it's just incredible to see her make that migration again. And, and going through Michigan is, is probably her preferred route. But this is what, what Todd was talking about. Some of that Golden Eagle telemetry data that they have from the Great Lakes that shows a number of other birds using the Upper Peninsula um, coming through Michigan, but also going um, around towards, I guess that would be the Toronto uh, route. Um, but yeah, this is, it's incredible that you all have amassed this data. Now you're really getting ready to use it to, to help decision makers like Tom and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, implement strategies to help these birds, you know, exist and and really, you know, I guess coexist with humans and the and the changes on the landscape. Um, so of course he's flying up to Wapus National Park, and that's up in Churchill, uh, Manitoba. And uh, we expect she'll probably arrive up there around, um, if not the end of March, maybe early April. And the area where she's heading is just a vast wetland dotted with lakes. Um, it's near the Hudson Bay. It's an incredibly wild area. We've been lucky enough to, to 
um, meet, uh, virtually meet, and to develop a relationship with some of the researchers up there in Wild Plus National Park and with Parks Canada. And we're hoping to, to um, you know, increase the amount of interaction we have and be able to study these birds, including Athena and possibly your mate, um, on their breeding territory up there um, and, and actually get some data on the nest. Uh, which have been documented up in Wapusk as being these giant nests up in trees. Um, you know, th these eagles go up to Canada uh, because I'm thinking, um, you know, it's a little too warm down here in the lower 48 for them. They, they really, you know, they can't withstand hot temperatures as much, but also it's a much wilder place. And also there's an incredible food source up there. Is that, is that something you would understand? You know, we... Um... We are, we have, if you think back to that map that Andrew showed right in the beginning of this presentation, we have a lot of telemetry data from Alaska. And uh, we are actually trying to understand, especially for young eagles, non territorial birds, they're less than five years old. We're trying to understand what might be the things that cause an eagle to go to one place in the North Country versus another. There's a lot of complex theory that's evolved. That's, that's evolved. There's a lot of complex theory that's been developed about why birds migrate and what are the costs and benefits. But it, it really does appear that at least one of the, the benefits to migration is going to areas that have good food resources, uh, that have good nesting resources. Uh, and, you know, that is. Uh, that, that probably has a lot to do with why these golden eagles made these. And I mean, there's some pretty spectacular habitat, there's pretty spectacular concentrations of prey species, whether it's, it's ground nesting, uh, ducks and geese, waterfowl, or whether it's things like uh, Arctic ground squirrels further west, or some of the lagomorph, the rabbit and hare populations. Uh, all this stuff is available to these eagles and being able to make these long migrations sets you up to take advantage of that food resource. And from an eagle's perspective, from an evolutionary biology perspective, really, um, the, the, the benefits to getting access to that food resource probably outweigh the costs that are incurred by making this long migra migratory journey, which is obviously going to be a little risky making a thousand or two thousand mile flight right right and tom i get asked this all the time is there ever a chance that golden eagles wouldn't nest down here at Bernheim? and i and i tell them that you know historically there may have been some nests throughout the appalachians tom do you know of any golden eagle nest in the lower 48 or uh in the eastern u.s yeah. in mississippi yeah. um not currently. Um, it is possible somewhere out there. If if I had to wager, I mm -hmm. guess maybe Maine would be the best bet. Sure. Um, historically, there were some documented nests in more northern states like New York, uh, New Hampshire, Maine, and uh, they slowly all kind of petered out. So I think the last one was occupied maybe. 1980s, I think, John, something like that. Well, the territory was occupied until 1997, 1997. in Maine, but they hadn't produced young since about 1992. Mm -hmm. And what we think, and this is suspicion, but what we think is that these birds were affected by DDT poisoning. And so they were holding a territory, producing mm -hmm. eggs, but they weren't able to actually bring those, those eggs were never able to hatch because their egg shells were so thinned by the DDT poisoning. And we think that the DDT poisoning, we do have some evidence of this because a couple of eggs that were infertile were taken from nests after the breeding season and they had high levels of, of DDT in them. And uh, we, we think that these birds were probably getting DDT by eating things like uh, herons and cormorants and other birds where their their nests are on shore and you an evil you know that they eat those kinds of food um, and herons and cormorants eat a lot of fish and so they're they're more likely to get DDT residues in their diet. Very interesting. Very interesting. 
Um, and so I, I think we're getting near the end where we want to take some questions, but I'll just put through a few few slides here. This is this is where we think Athena is going to head again, in, as in previous years. She will end at that northern point up there on the western side of the Hudson Bay near Churchill, Manitoba. Um, better known for its polar bears, beluga whales, and northern lights, but you know we're finding that that golden eagles also um, enjoy spending some time up there. And, you know, Bernheim works so hard to manage their habitats down here on the winter range. It's really important for us to, to protect that habitat, whether it's, whether it's on the winter or the summer range, because they, they really depend upon both of them. You know, it's not a, it's not a either or. Um, and it's really an honor for Bernheim to have that international connection through golden eagles, but also we realize that other species like the monarchs and the migratory birds and some of these other species have international migratory routes. And it's really hard to, to manage a species like that, isn't it, Tom? When you're, you know, you, you're a US Fish and Wildlife Service biologist, but do you have a lot of interactions with, with the folks up in Canada or even down in Mexico for some of these species? Uh, we do. I mean, it's it's a truism birds do not respect borders and that, that could be international it could be state mm -hmm. and uh eastern golden eagles are a particularly unique example because you know these are three to five three to five thousand birds total and they're spanning themselves across 25 u.s states and probably three four or five canadian provinces and so that's why the work of you know eastern golden eagle working group and pulling all this information together is so critical yeah, yeah, and and the threats are are definitely out there, and the and the land and the habitats that they have used historically are changing. You know, this is an image right outside of Bernheim. As you come down I sixty five from Louisville, uh, you'll notice there's just industrial warehouses popping up everywhere. Um, and while growth is good in the community, we've got to make sure that conservation keeps pace with that uh, development. And right now, I'm afraid to say conservation is losing. And, um, you know, we know that the golden eagles from looking at their tracks, they don't utilize these areas. They don't even fly over areas that look like this. Um, so figuring out how we can, we can maintain and manage large forest blocks and, and wild places here in central Kentucky is going to be imperative if we want to keep these golden eagles coming down here um, and, and keep them being successful at, uh, at, at utilizing places like Bernheim. Um, you know, and it's not just about the golden eagles, you know, Bernheim works hard to, to maintain a whole host of habitats that are being lost from this development around us, in particular the wetlands. Um, you know, those industrial warehouses sit on floodplains, which used to historically be wetlands that, that supported a, a number of other creatures from amphibians all the way up to raptors. Um, species like beavers, which are now returning to Bernheim, have been lost throughout all of these wetlands and floodplains, and and it's really nice for us to give voice to some of these species, um, like the golden eagles, like the beavers, like the bobcats, and even the littlest creatures like these micro snails, the bluff vertigo, which is an incredibly rare snail, which is only known from Bernheim in Kentucky, and known from from a little over thirty sites globally. Um, you know, we've got to keep working with groups like the Eastern Golden Eagle uh, working group to, to give voice to these species. And I really appreciate Todd and Tom being here and all the work that they do to support golden eagles and raptors. Um, and at this point, I wanted to throw it over if anybody in the audience had any questions about, about our golden eagle research, about the working group, the conservation plan, or just Bernheim in general. Uh, so thank you all for being here today, um, and this will be recorded and posted if anybody else wants to to check it out later. So if any any questions out there? Hey Andrew, this is Richie Kessler. Hey Richie. Hey again, yeah, definitely appreciate you guys coming in and sharing your knowledge with this group today, and and hopefully the fact that it's going to be recorded will uh, will mean many others will be able to benefit from your knowledge, including my ornithology class down here at Campbellsville University, who I plan to share this with during a class period later. Get, get me out of having to lecture. So uh, <laughs> uh, my question for you guys is, um, I guess I, I'm asking you to comment on the role of, of Bernheim as a place and the staff at Bernheim in terms of their engagement with Athena and with this uh, Golden Eagle project and, and work. 
you know, how significant has that been or will that be in terms of what it contributes to the broader knowledge regarding Golden Eagle uh, conservation? And then a second part to that would be, you know, if if you could uh, have a crystal ball and, and, and ask Bernheim to do something to further benefit uh, Golden Eagles uh, in our region, what would that be? Gosh, uh, Bernheim's really, <clears throat> What Bernheim has been doing has been really important uh, for our understanding of golden eagles in this part of the world. You know, we have, in terms of getting telemetry data from golden eagles, we have we have data from almost well from about probably fifteen or eighteen U.S. states uh, and the vast majority of the states in the east where we know there are winter golden. We don't have any birds that we've trapped in Florida, for example, because we don't know of any wintering sites in Florida. Um, I think that Bernheim is the only spot in Kentucky where we've where golden eagles have been trapped. And so all of our knowledge from Kentucky either comes from birds that we've trapped at Bernheim or birds that we've trapped in adjacent states that have wandered into Kentucky and then almost always left. So getting this information is really unique. Another thing that's unique about the data from Bernheim is that uh, we have this, this potential evidence of a mated pair on, on wintering grounds. And that's something that's really unusual. We just don't, haven't seen any, any in any other place and, and it's a really cool thing for us to be able to see um, in terms of what bernheim can do you know we are putting together this uh, eastern golden eagle conservation plan and uh, there will be a series of, of potential actions that can be suggested or taken and i think following those actions um, is is or or you know, using that as a starting point for potential actions is, is something that's it's really good. Um, one one other thing that you know people can also consider, um, you know, one of the biggest threats to golden eagles in the east is lead exposure, and uh, there are a lot of programs, there are opportunities for hunters to use non lead ammunition, and <clears throat> there are there are. There are things that if people want to take individual actions, uh, you know, using non-lead ammunition, hunters who can use non-lead ammunition, or if you know a hunter, you can encourage a hunter to use non-lead ammunition. And those are the types of things that should people choose to do it, they can do that. And that's actually a difference that an individual can make at a personal level. You know, it's, it's, it's very hard for individuals to address climate change, right? Climate change is a threat to golden eagles, but there are things should people choose that they can do if they want to, to address the lead poisoning issue. That's great. Thanks for your question, Richie, that was a good one. Um, any other questions from anybody? Hi, right. yes, this is Carol Wilson. Um, and I'm just curious whether um, your research offers any like citizen involvement aspects. Um, and and I am a hunter. Um, I hunt both archery as well as with gun. But I also know several people who are involved with um, tracking with dogs for um, you know to recover a carcass, for instance. That it is archery shot not recovered in time to use the meat. So I was curious whether in situations like that, if there is ever any acceptance of donations of carcasses for your purpose? Um, in general, no. I mean, we usually try to find deer that are just right off the side of Bernheim. Uh, Highway 245, which cuts through here, usually has a pretty, a pretty good uh, amount. Uh, we appreciate the offer, but you know, for now, um, I would say, I would say not. Um, but we do appreciate your your um, willingness to do that, and also your um, you know thinking about you know using non lead ammo as, as a hunter, sure. um, and how you can play a part to to keep the raptors and other animals because it's not just the raptors that get lead poisoning. I mean, nobody knows about how many bobcats get 
lead poisoning or coyotes or other species like that, even, um, you know, even vultures get lead poisoning and, and they're a part of the function and ecosystem. Um, yeah. Carol, one, um, one of the things we ran into with the, uh, the, the camera traffic, we actually had to stop our camera traffic program uh, five or seven years ago. And the reason we had to stop it was because of concerns about CWD, chronic wasting disease mm. here. And most states where there is CWD prefer that we are not moving deer carts as long distances because there's a concern that if you have a, a, a sick deer or a deer that has CWD and you move that carcass 200 miles or 100 miles, you could be spreading CWD. And so we actually, and there's actually also evidence that uh, the, C, the CWD prions, these, small, these proteins that can that cause the disease, actually remain intact after they've been through a bird's digestive tract. And so there was concern that, that by, by feeding these birds, if, if you are moving deer and then feeding infected animals to birds, you could really be spreading this. So we, um, the, I think that it's wise for Bernheim from a disease management perspective, it's wise for Bernheim to not be moving, you know, for, to be sourcing deer locally for the, for the work they're doing. But yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I did not realize that about the pathogens being able to survive through. Yeah. That's I, somebody brought it up and I said, that can't be true because it sounds so crazy. And then I, I contacted some science, some pathologists at the, the USGS, my colleagues at the USGS Wildlife Health Center in Madison. And they, they said, not only is it true, but they sent me a pile of papers, <laughs> that studies, repeated studies showing that it was true. And uh, I was, I was surprised and unhappy because it made us <laughs> shut down this program uh, you know one one thing uh uh richie you had said you're going to show this to your ornithology class uh, if you uh, if you google my name you can get my email address if your class has questions about golden eagles in the east i'm i'm happy to answer them or direct those questions to somebody who can answer them better than i can will do thank thanks for that Fantastic. Thank you, Carol, for your question. Any more questions before we wrap it up? Okay, well, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be un unveiling this Eastern Golden Eagle Conservation Plan uh, really soon. I hope to have that out to the public. I don't think it'll hit the public this week, but it'll be really soon. Um, so again, I want to thank Tom Wittig with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Todd Caster with the U.S. Geological Service. And again, I'm Andrew Berry, Director of Conservation here at Bernheim. We really appreciate all the support you all give Bernheim, uh, not just for the Golden Eagles, but for all wildlife and, and nature itself. So thank you all. Hope to see you down here at Bernheim. <laughs>